Hello, good evening. Where are my captions? Where are my captions? Oh, I forgot to turn them on. There we go. Uh, right. <laughs> I did at re least remember to reset the link earlier today. All right, so here we are. We're ready to start a new book. This one is The Temple and the Lodge. Okay. And um, I looked ahead. I didn't read anything, but I looked ahead at how long how long the introduction and stuff are. And it looks like we'll probably do the intro and prelude tonight. Um, and there are a few pictures in the prelude that we'll look at. But otherwise, um, let's just jump straight on into it. In Britain, during the last few years, Freemasonry has become both a favorite topic of conversation and a cherished issue of debate. Indeed, Mason baiting bids, uh, bids fair to become something of a full-fledged blood sport here, rather than priest baiting in Ireland, rather like priest baiting in Ireland. With scarcely disguised exuberance and a virtually audible tally-ho, the newspapers swoop on each other on each new Masonic scandal. Quote-unquote Masonic scandal. Each new allegation of Masonic corruption, church synods ponder the c compatibility of Freemasonry with Christ, with Christ... Wow! Getting off to a rough start with Christianity. In order to goad political opponents, local councils propose motions that would compel Freemasons to declare themselves. At parties, Freemasonry crops up with a frequency exceeded probably only by Britain's intelligence service and the CIA. Television, television too, has made its contribution, conducting at least one late-night symposium on the subject and actually managing to poke its cameras into the beast's ultimate lair, Grand Lodge. On failing to find a dragon, the commentators seem to feel less relief than an aggrieved sulkiness at having somehow been cheated. In the meantime, of course, people have remained fascinated. One need only pronounce the word Freemasonry in a pub 
restaurant, hotel lobby, or other public place to see heads twitch, faces swivel attentively, ears fine-tune themselves to eavesdrop. Each new expose is devoured with an eagerness, even a glee, usually reserved for royal gossip or for the salacious. By the way, before I go on, I wanted to see when was this book actually published. I forgot to say that. It looks like, and this is the first edition book. Um, it was published in 1989, so a bit dated. But um should still be a good read. This book is not an expose. It does not address itself to the role or the activities, real or imagined, of Freemasonry in contemporary society. It does not attempt to investigate allegations of conspiracy or corruption. Neither, of course, is it an apology for Freemasonry. We are not Freemasons ourselves, and we have no vested interest in exculpating the institution from the charges leveled against it. Our orientation has been wholly historical. We have endeavored to track down the antecedents of Freemasonry, to establish its true origins, to chart its evolution and development, to assess its influence on British and American culture during its own formative years, culminating with the late 18th century. We have also tried to address the question of why Freemasonry, nowadays so instinctively regarded with suspicion, with derision, with irony, and condescension, should ever have come to enjoy the currency it did, and for that matter still does, despite its detractors. And I don't remember hearing anything about Masonry or Freemasonry in the news in... <clears throat> Like in the 80s, 90s, I don't remember anything like that um, in America. Maybe it was a big thing. Maybe there were some scandals going on in Britain. I don't know. But anyway. In the process, however, we have inevitably been obliged to confront the kind of question that lo questions that loom in the public mind today and are so often posted by the media. Is Freemasonry corrupt? Is it even more sinisterly a vast international conspiracy dedicated to some obscure and, if secrecy is a barometer of villainy, nefarious end? Is it a conduit for perks, favors, influence, and power brokering in the heart of such institutions as the city and the police? I would believe that. Most questions are not directly pertinent to the pages that follow, but they are of uh, sorry, uh, it was such questions, I don't know where I went. Oh, I skipped, I read part of a line. Okay, I'm sorry. Most important of all, perhaps, is it truly inimical to Christianity? Such questions are not directly pertinent to the pages that follow but they are of understandable general concern. It will not be inappropriate, therefore, if we offer here the answers to them that emerged in the course of our inquiries. <clears throat> One has attained a measure of wisdom when, instead of exclaiming, Et tu brut? Brute? Um, how would you pronounce that? Et tu... We'll just say brute. Uh, one nods ruefully and says, yes, it figures. Given human nature, it would be surprising if there were not at least some degree of corruption in public and private institutions, and if some of this corruption did not involve Freemasonry. We would argue, however, that such corruption says less about Freemasonry itself than about the ways in which Freemasonry, like any other such structure, can be abused. Greed, self-aggrandizement, favoritism and other such ills have been endemic to human society since the emergence of civilization. They have availed themselves of and operated through every available channel, blood kinship, a shared past, 
bonds formed in school or in the armed forces, mutual interest, simple friendship, as well, of course, as race, religion, and political affiliation. Freemasonry, accused, for example, of making special dispensations for its own, in the Christianized West, until very recently, a man could expect from his fellows precisely the same special, special dispensation simply by virtue of his membership in the Freemasonry of Christianity, by virtue, in other words, of not being a Hindu, Muslim, Buddhist, or Jew. Freemasonry is only one of many channels whereby corruption and favoritism can flourish. But if Freemasonry did not exist, corruption and favoritism would flourish all the same. Corruption and favoritism can be found in schools, in regiments, in corporations, in governmental bodies, in political parties, in sects and churches, in innumerable other organizations. None of these is in itself intrinsically reprehensible. No one would think of condemning an entire political party or an entire church because certain of its members were corrupt or more sympathetically disposed towards other members than towards outsiders. No one would condemn the family as an institution because it tends to foster nepotism. You can tell this was written 30 some plus years ago because nowadays absolutely they condemn an entire party uh, because of some people or they condemn families for because of some things they condemn the police for some police being bad it's yeah anyway how times have changed in any moral consideration of the matter it is necessary to exercise an understanding of elementary psychology and a modicum of common sense institutions are only as virtuous or as culpable as the individuals who compose them. If an institution can be considered corrupt in any intrinsic sense at all, it can be considered so only if it profits from the corruption of its members. This might apply to, say, a military dictatorship, to certain totalitarian or single-party states, but it is hardly applicable to Freemasonry. No one has ever suggested that Freemasonry ever gained anything through the transgressions of its brethren. On the contrary, the transgressions of individual Freemasons are entirely selfish and self-serving. Freemasonry as a whole suffers from such transgressions as does Christianity from the transgressions of its adherent, in adherents. In the question of corruption, then, Freemasonry is not in itself a culprit, but on the contrary, another victim of unscrupulous men who are prepared to exploit it along with anything else for their own ends. A more valid question is the compatibility or lack thereof between Freemasonry and Christianity. By its very nature, this question at least implies an attempt to confront what Freemasonry actually is, rather than the ways in which it can be exploited or abused. Ultimately, however, this question Two is spurious. As is well known, Freemasonry does not purport to be a religion, only to address itself to certain principles or truths, which might in some sense be construed as religion, or perhaps religious, or perhaps spiritual. It may offer a species of methodology, but it does not pretend to offer a theology. This distinction will become clearer in the pages that follow. From the moment, it will be sufficient to make two points in connection with the current antipathy toward Freemasonry on the part of the Anglican Church amidst the Church's present preoccupation with Freemasonry in her ranks. These points are generally overlooked. Both are crucial. In the first place, Freemasonry and the Anglican Church have cohabitated, cohabited congenially since the beginning of the 17th century. Indeed, they have done more than cohabited. Um, they have worked in tandem. Some of the most important Anglican ecclesiastics of the last four centuries have issued from the Lodge. 
some of the most eloquent and influential Freemasons have issued from the ministry. At no time prior to the last 10 or 15 years has a church ever invade against Freemasonry. Invade. I have never even seen that word before. I have I get it from the context, but new word for me. Um, has the church ever invade against Freemasonry, ever perceived any incompatibility between free, Freemasonry and its own theological principles? Freemasonry has not changed. The church would argue that it has not changed either, at least in its fundamental tenets. Why then, if there has never been any conflict in the past, should there be conflict now? The answer to that question, we would suggest, lies less with Freemasonry than with the attitudes and mentalities of certain contemporary churchmen. That's what I was going to say. The church might not have changed, but the people have. The second point worth considering is, if anything, even more decisive. The official head of the Anglican Church is the British monarch, since James II was deposed in 1688, the monarch's theological status or credentials have never been subject to question, and yet since the beginning of the 17th century, the British monarchy has also been closely involved in Freemasonry. At least six kings, as well as numerous princes of the blood and prince consorts, have been Freemasons. Would this be possible? possible if there were indeed some theological incompatibility between Freemasonry and the Church. To argue such incompatibility is tantamount, in effect, to, to impugning the religious integrity of the monarchy. Ultimately, we would maintain the current controversy surrounding Freemasonry is a storm in a teacup, a number of non-issues or spurious issues inflated far beyond the status they actually deserve. It is tempting to flip and suggest that people have nothing better to do than man manufacture such tenuous grounds for controversy. Where was I? Ah, unfortunately, they do have better things to do. Certainly, the Anglican Church, with incipient schism um, in its ranks and a disastrously shrinking congregation, could deploy its energy and resources more constructively than in orchestrating crusades against a supposed enemy, which, in fact, is not an enemy at all. And while it is perfectly appropriate, even desirable, for the media to ferret out corruption, we would all be better served if the corrupt individuals themselves were called to account, rather than the institution of which they happen to be members. At the same time, it must be acknowledged that Freemasonry itself has done little to improve its own image in the public eye. Indeed, by its obsessive secrecy and its stubborn defensiveness, it has only reinforced the conviction that it has something to hide. How little it does in fact have to hide will become apparent in the course of this book. If anything, it has more to be proud of than it does to conceal. That is the introduction. The Temple in the Lodge. And then we get into the prelude, which is, I don't know, like ten pages or so, with a couple of pictures. Um, I don't... Eleven... Actually, it's about thirteen pages with a couple of pictures. And I think that's about all my voice is going to be able to handle tonight. So we will pick up on um, the first chapter in the next read. So, prelude. Ten years ago, in the spring of seven, 1978, while researching the Knights Templar for a projected television documentary, we became intrigued by the Order's history in Scotland. The surviving documentation was meager, but Scotland possessed an even greater wealth of legend and tradition about the Templars than did most other places. There were also some very real mysteries, unexplained enigmas which, in the absence of reliable records, Orthodox historians had scarcely attempted to account for. If we could penetrate these mysteries, it would, 
if we could find even a kernel of truth behind the legends and traditions, the implications would be enormous, not only for the history of the Templars, but extending far beyond as well. A woman we knew had recently moved with her husband to live in Aberdeen. On a visit back to London, they recounted to us a story they had heard from another man who had worked for a time in an, in an hotel in a small tourist community, formerly a Victorian watering spot on the western shore of Loch Awe, A-W-E, Awe, Loch Awe, uh, in the highlands of Argyle. Loch Awe is a large inland lake some 25 miles from Oban. The lake itself is 28 miles long and varies in width for the most part from half a mile to a mile. It is dotted with just another, or under two dozen islands and of various sizes, some natural, others man-made, and formerly connected to the shore by causeways of now submerged stones and timber. Like Loch Ness, Loch Awe is supposed to contain a monster, the Betachmor. Um, I know that's wrong. That's my best guess at the um, Gaelic. Described as Uh, described as a large serpent-like creature with a horse's head and twelve legs sheathed in scales. On one of the islands, according to the story, our informant had heard there were a number of Templar graves, more than would make sense in the context of accepted history, for the Templars were not known to have been active around Argyle or the western highlands. On the same island, how, moreover, there were supposedly the ruins of a Templar preceptory, which did not figure in any of our lists of Templar holdings. As we received it at third hand, the name of the island sounded something like In This Shield, but we could not be sure of that, still less of the spelling. These fragments of information, even though unconfirmed, had frustratingly and frustratingly vague, were tantalizing. Like many researchers before us, we were familiar with nebulous accounts of bands of Templars surviving the official persecution and dissolution of their order between 1307 and 1314. We were familiar with the stories that one such enclave of knights, fleeing their tormentors on the continent and in England, had found a refuge in Scotland and, at least for a time, had perpetuated something of their original institutions. But we were also aware that most such traditions had originated with the Freemasons of the 18th century, who sought to establish for themselves a pedigree extending directly back to the Templars of four centuries before. In consequence, we were extremely skeptical. We knew that no, no accepted evidence for any Templar survival in Scotland existed, and that even modern Freemasonry tended, in general, to dismiss all claims to the contrary as sheer invention and wishful thinking. <clears throat> um, there's a picture here. It might talk about it in the next paragraph, but I'm going to go ahead and um, show you the picture. Um, Kilnair Church, Loch Awe, Argyle. The ruins date from the 13th century. In the foreground is a gravestone with a graffiti Templar-style cross. So, I'll start up top. So that's the building. And then down here, you'll see, is that gravestone with the cross on it. <clears throat> and yet the tale of the island in the lake continued to haunt us. We had planned a research trip to Scotland for that summer, all, anyway, all by far to the east. Should we not perhaps make a leisurely western detour, if only to disprove the story we had heard and exercise it once and for all from our minds? Accordingly, we decided to extend our trip for by a few days and return via Argyle. As we descended on Loch Awe from the north, we immediately saw at the head of it, masked by 
serried firs, the large 15th century Campbell Castle of Kilkern. We proceeded down the eastern side of the lake. After some 15 miles, an island appeared to our right, perhaps 50 yards from the shore. On it stood the ruins of the 13th century castle of Innes Connell. C-H-O-N-N-E-L. I'm going to say Connell. Uh, which was occupied around 1308 by Robert the Bruce's close friend, ally, and brother-in-law, Sir Neil Campbell, and which for the next century and a half had been Clan Campbell's primary seat. Then, when a new castle was built at Inverary, at the upper reaches of Loch Fyne, Innes Connell was turned into a prison for the enemies of the Campbells, or as they had by then become the Earls of Argyll. A mile south of Inisconnel, there was a smaller island just visible from the road through the trees and shrubs fringing the shore. When we stopped, we could see the remains on it of a structure of some sort and stones which appeared to gr be graves. Oh, several more pictures here we'll come back to. On the opposite side of the road as the hamlet of Portnish Wow um, Portnish Herrick I have no idea but it's a long word P O R T I N N I S H E R R I C H If you know how to pronounce that let me know The island island itself according to the maps we consulted, was variously called Innes Sirech, Sirech or Innes Siramach. Again, Gaelic. <laughs> Don't know what to tell you. Uh, he promptly, we promptly pole vaulted to the conclusion that this was the Innes shield we had been seeking. Okay, so let's get let's show these pictures here real quick. So I showed you the first one, and there are five more. So the second one is Kilmartin Church, Argyle. In the foreground is an example of the anonymous warrior's graves marked only with a sword. There are some 80 at this site alone. Okay, so I'll show you that one first. So that, that's this one, Kilmartin Church. Marked only with a sword, and that's right there at the bottom. There's a sword carved into the top. I don't know how well you can see that. You see those two parallel lines, that's the blade, and... Um, over here where my finger is on that end of the marker is the hilt. Uh, the second one uh, above, uh, let's see, Kilmartin, further examples of the 14th and 15th century graves of a style unknown except in the order of the temple. So that would be this upper one. And then the third picture here is detail of gravestone, Kilmartin. This sword has been dated tentatively to the 14th century. So that's, oh, there we go. Oh. Come on, there we go. So that, is that the one? I think that's the the um, one on the ground there. Moving on, we've got two more pictures here. Uh, the ruined 13th century chapel of Kilmory, Loch Sween, Argyle, with the Isle of Jura in the background. Um, this marks the end of the only safe sea route to Scotland during the early years of Robert Bruce. That would be here. Uh, 
you can see more gravestones standing there. And the last one, some uh, stone cross of typical Templar style, now housed inside the chapel of Kilmary. Its date has not yet been satisfactorily established. And that would be this. Okay, so moving on. The island lay some 40 yards from the shore, along which there were a number of boats, most of them obviously functional and in regular use. Hoping to rent one and row out to the island, we inquired at the general store in Port Nishirich. Um, there, however, we encountered a, seri a curious evasiveness. Although the area was postcard scenic and must have relied to at least some degree on the tourist trade, we were not made to feel in any way welcome. Why, we were asked guardedly, did we want to rent a boat? To explore the island, we replied. No boat was available for rental. We were told people did not rent boats. Could we hire someone, boat and all, to row us out to the island? No, we were told, without any explanation or elaboration. That was not possible either. Frustrated and all the more convinced that Innes Sirich must contain something of relevance, we wandered on foot along the shore from across the intervening strip of water. The island beckoned tauntingly, almost within stone-throwing distance, yet inaccessible. We discussed the possibility of swimming out to it and were debating the likely coldness of the water when, just north of the hamlet, we encountered an el elderly couple with a tent erected beside a caravan. After an exchange of casual courtesies, they invited us to share a cup of tea with them. They, too, it transpired, came from London. For the last fifteen years or so, however, they had been coming to this spot every summer, setting up their caravan and fishing along Loch Awe. Inside their caravan, we had to squeeze past the end of a table onto a long bench. To one side, there was a smaller table, or flat surface of some kind, used probably for preparing food. On this, an old book lay open at a page with what appeared to be an engraving of a Masonic tomb. We noted certain Masonic symbols and a skull and crossbones. Subsequently, subsequently, we realized that what we had what we had seen might have been a Masonic tracing board of the kind used in the 18th century. In any case, we inquired quite casually about the prevalence of Freemasonry in the area, whereupon the book was quickly but discreetly closed, and our query was deflected with a shrug. We asked, asked our hosts if they could tell us anything about the island. Not much, they replied. Yes, there were ruins of some sort out there, and yes, there were some graves, though not many, and not that that old. In fact, the couple told us most of the graves were fairly recent. But the island, they said, did, did seem to enjoy some sort of special significance. They did not venture to suggest what it might be. Bodies, they reported, were sometimes brought there for burial, from considerable distances, sometimes even flown across the Atlantic from the United States. Quite clearly, this had nothing to do with the 13th or 14th century Templars. Nevertheless, it was intriguing. It might, of course, involve nothing more than a tradition of local families, whose descendants, in accordance with some established ritual or custom, were buried in native soil. On the other hand, there might just possibly be something more to the matter, something pertaining perhaps to Freemasonry, <clears throat> which our hosts were patently loath to discuss. They had a boat of their own, which they used for fishing. We asked if we could hire it, or if they would row us out to the island. At first they were a little reluctant, repeating their assertion that we would find nothing of interest. But at last, perhaps infected by our curiosity, the man offered to row us out while his wife prepared another pot of tea. The island proved disappointing. It was extremely small, no more than 30 yards across. It did contain the ruins of a diminutive chapel, but these consisted of nothing more than some sections 
of wall jutting a few feet up from the soil. There was no way of ascertaining whether the dilapidated mossy remains were indeed once a Templar chapel. They were certainly too small to have been a preceptory. As for the graves, most of them were, as we'd been told, of comparatively recent date. The earliest date was 1732, the latest from the 1960s. Certain family names occurred, Jameson, McCallum, Sinclair. On one stone of First World War vintage, there was a Masonic square and compass. The island obviously had something to do with local families, some of whom probably incidentally were involved in Freemasonry, but there was nothing that could be construed as Templar. Perhaps nothing to support the account we had heard of a Templar graveyard. If there was any mystery about the place at all, it appeared to be both local and minor. Thwarted and frustrated, we decided to find a bed and breakfast for the night, collect our thoughts, and if possible, work out how the information we'd received could have been so flagrantly askew. We proceeded down the eastern shores of Loch Awe, towards the road that led to Loch Fine, and thence to Glasgow. At this time, dusk was approaching. We stopped at a village named Kilmartin, passed the southern end of the loch and asked where we might find a place to stay. We were directed to a large converted house a few miles beyond the town, near some ancient Celtic cairns. Having checked in there, we returned to Kilmartin for a drink at the pub. Although larger than Port Nishrich, Kilmartin was still little more than a hamlet with a petrol station, a pub, a recommendable restaurant and some two dozen houses all concentrated on one side of the road. On the other side was a large parish church with a tower. The whole structure had either been built or extensively restored during the last century. We did not expect to discover anything of consequence at Kilmartin. It was only idle curiosity that led us to enter the churchyard, but there, not on an island in a lake, but in the grounds of a parish church, were rank after strictly regimented rank of badly weathered flat stones. There were upwards of eighty of them. Some had sunk so deeply into the ground that the grass was already growing over them. Others were still intact and clearly defined among the more modern raised tombs and family burial plots. Many of the t stones, particularly those of later date and better condition, were adorned with elaborate carvings, decorative motifs, family or clan devices, a welter of shamanic, uh, shaman where did I get shamanic? Wow, Masonic symbols. <laughs> Others had been worn completely smooth, but what interested us were those that bore no dec decoration save a single, simple, and austere straight sword. These swords varied in size and sometimes, even if only slightly, in design. According to the practice of the time, the dead man's sword would be laid on the stone, its outline would be incised, and then chiseled. The carving would thus reflect precisely the dimensions, shape, and style of the original weapon. It was this stark, anonymous sword that marked the earliest of the stones, those most badly worn, weathered, and eroded. On the later stones, names and dates were added to the sword, then decorative motifs, family and clan devices, Masonic symbols. There were even some women's graves. It seemed we had found the Templar graveyard we were seeking. The sheer existence of the ranked graves in Kilmartin must surely have elicited questions from visitors other than ourselves. Who were the fighting men buried there? Why were there so many of them in such an out-of-the-way place? What explanations were offered by local authorities and antiquarians? The plaque at the church shed only meager light on the matter. All it said was that the earliest of the slabs dated from around 1300, the latest from the early 18th century. Most, the plaque concluded, are the work of a group of sculptors working around Loch Awe in the late 14th and 15th centuries. What group of sculptors? If they were known to have con constituted a group in any form or organized sense, as clearly seemed to be the case, surely something more, more must be known about them. And was it 
not rather unusual for sculptors to congregate in groups unless for some specific purpose or purpose or under some specific aegis that of a royal or aristocratic court for example or of a religious order in any case if the plaque was vague about who had had carved the stones it was worse than vague about who had been buried under them it said nothing i'm actually going to take a very quick break because my drink is almost gone and i find that if i keep my throat nice and wet my voice lasts longer so i will be back in just a minute just long enough to refill the, the cup Okay, and we're back. Whatever the impressions conveyed by books, films, and romanticized history, swords were a rare and expensive commodity in the early 14th century. Every fighting man did not, as a matter of course, own one. Many were too poor and had to use axes or spears. Nor, for that matter, was there much of an arms industry in Scotland at the time, and particularly in this part of Scotland. Most of the blades then in use in the country had to be imported, which made them all the more costly. Given these facts, the graves at Kilmartin could not have been those of ordinary rank-and-file soldiery, the 14th century equivalent of cannon fodder. On the contrary, the men commemorated by the stones had to be of some social consequence well-to-do individual individuals affluent gentry if not full-fledged knights but was it plausible that men of wealth and social status would be buried anonymously far more than today prominent individuals of the 14th century plumed themselves on their family uh on their family their ancestry their lineage their pedigree and this was particularly true in scotland where clan affiliations and relationships enjoyed especial significance and were where identity and blood descent were given a sometimes obsessive emphasis such things were in insistently stressed in life and duly memorialized in death Finally, why were the earliest of the graves at Kilmartin, the anonymous graves marked only by the straight sword, so lacking in all Christian symbolism, lacking even in anything as basic as a cross? In an age when the church's hegemony over Western Europe was virtually unchallenged, only tombs with effigies on them were left unadorned by Christian iconography and such tombs were invariably placed in chapels or churches the tombs at kilmartin however were situated outdoors were devoid of effigies yet still lacked religious adornment was the hilt of the sword itself intended to denote the cross or were the graves those of men perceived in one sense or another not to have been properly christian in 1296 on Sir Neil Campbell, Bruce, Bruce's friend, ally and eventual brother-in-law, oh, from 1296 on, um, had been 
Bailey of Kilmartin and Loch Awe. And since Kilmartin itself had been one of his seats, it would have been reasonable to suppose that the earliest of the graves there were those of Sir Neil's men. But what that would not serve to explain their anonymity, nor the absence of Christian symbolism. Unless, of course, the men who served under Sir Neil were not native to the area, nor conventionally Christian, and had some reason to keep their identities concealed even in death. During the course of our research, we had explored most of the ruins of Templar preceptories still surviving in England, and many of those in France, Spain, and the Middle East. We were familiar almost to the point of cessation, cessation uh, with the varieties of Templar sculpture, Templar devices, Templar embellishment, and in the few instances where they could still be found, Templar graves. Those graves displayed the, displayed the same characteristics as the graves in Kilmartin. They were invariably simple, austere, devoid of decoration. Frequently, though not always, they were marked by the simple straight sword. They were always anonymous. Indeed, it was the very anonymity of Templar graves that distinguished them from the elaborate inscriptions, decorations, monuments, and sarcophagi of other nobles. The Templars were, after all, a Masonic order, oh, oh sorry, a monast monastic order, a society of warrior monks, soldier mystics. Even if only in theory they had supposedly renounced, as individuals at least, the trappings and pretensions of the material world. When one entered the temple, one effectively relinquished one's identity, becoming subsumed by the order. The stark, unadorned image of the straight sword was supposed to bear testimony to the ascetic, self-abnegating piety which obtained within the order's ranks. Historians, especially Masonic historians, had long sought either to prove or disprove definitively the alleged survival of the Templars in Scotland after the order had been officially suppressed elsewhere. But these historians had looked for and in and in documentation not on the ground. Not surprisingly, they had found no conclusive evidence one way or the other because most of the relevant documentation had been lost, destroyed, suppressed, falsified, or deliberately discredited. On the other hand, historians of Argyll, who were aware of the graves at Kilmartin, had had no reason to think of the Templars, since the Templars were not known to have been active or even present in the region. So far as their European bases were concerned, the Templars were strongest in France, Spain, Germany, Italy, and England. Such holdings as they officially possessed in Scotland were, at least according to readily accessible records, far to the east in the vicinity of Edinburgh and Aberdeen. There would have been no grounds for supposing an enclave of the order to have existed in Argyll unless one were specifically looking for it. Thus, it appeared to us the graves at Kilmartin had preserved their secret from historical researchers of both camps, chroniclers of the Templars and of Freemasonry on the one hand, and on the other, chron chroniclers of the immediate region who had no, no reason even to think of Templars. Needless to say, we were excited by our discovery, and we felt it to be all the more significant because it seemed to pertain not only to the Templars, they appeared to, to be a coherent pattern linking the earliest graves at Kilmartin, those we supposed were Templar, and the later ones adorned with family blazons, clan devices, and Masonic symbolism. The earlier graves seemed to grade gradually into the later ones, or rather, the later ones seemed by a process of assimilation and, and accretion to have evolved out of the earlier. The motifs were essentially the same, only something more elaborately embellished with the years. The later decorations did not simply replace the straight sword, but were added to it. The graves at Kilmartin seemed to offer their own mute but eloquent testimony to, the, to an ongoing development, to bear witness to a story spanning 
four centuries, from the beginning of the 14th to the beginning of the 18th. In the pub that evening, we attempted to decipher the chronicles in the stones. Could we really have stumbled upon an enclave of refugee Templars, who on the dissolution of their order had found a haven in what was then the wilderness of Argyle? Might they have taken in yet more refugees from abroad? Argyle, though difficult to reach by land in the early 14th century, was readily accessible by sea, and the Templars possessed a substantial fleet, which was never found by their precur per persecutors in Europe. Had the green forest-shagged hills and glens around us once housed an entire community of white-mantled knights like a lost tribe or lost city in an adventure story, and had the order here perpetuated itself, its rituals and observances. But if it were to perpetuate itself beyond a single generation, the knights would have had to secularize, or at least would have, have had to abrogate their vow of chastity and marry. Was this perhaps part of the process to which the stones bore witness, the gradual intermarriage of refugee Templars and members of the clan system, and out of that alliance between the Templars and the clans of Argyle might there have originated one of the schemes that were to lead to later Freemasonry? In the stones of Kilmartin might we not perhaps be confronted by a concrete answer to one of the most perplexing questions in European history? the origins and development of Freemasonry itself. We did not include any of what we had discovered in our film, which had by that time already been partially scripted. Its orientation, moreover, was primarily towards the Templars in the Holy Land and France, and in our findings in Scotland proved valid. If our findings in Scotland proved valid, they would, we felt, warrant a film of their own. For the moment, however, all we had was a plausible theory, with, in the absence of immediate accessible documentation, no way of confirming it. In the meantime, other projects, other commitments had begun to intervene, and our discoveries in Scotland were shunted ever further into the background. We did not lose sight of them, however. They continued to haunt us and to exercise a hold on our imaginations. During the ensuing nine years, we proceeded, if only in a desultory manner, to gather additional information. We consulted the work of Marion Campbell, probably the region's most prominent local historian, and established a personal correspondence with her. She advised us to be wary of any premature conclusions, but she was intrigued by our theory. If there were no records of the Templars holding land in Argyle, she said this was more likely to indicate an absence of records than an absence of Templars, and she found it indeed possible that the arrival of Templars in the region might explain the sudden appearance of the anonymous straight sword amid the more traditional, more familiar Celtic embellishments and motifs. We also consulted such additional published work as existed on the stones at Kilmartin, from the research of 19th century antiquarians to a more recent opus, published in 1977, under the auspices of the Royal Commission on the Ancient and Historical Monuments of Scotland. To our disappointment, most such material concentrated primarily on the latter, more elaborately embellished stones. The earlier stones, marked by the single anonymous straight sword, were largely ignored, if only because nothing was known about them and no one had anything much to say. Nevertheless, certain important facts did emerge. We learned from Marion Campbell, for example, that the stones in the churchyard at Kilmartin had not originally been situated there. Some had been inside the church, or rather inside a much earlier church. Others had been scattered throughout the surrounding countryside and only later relocated. We also learned that Kilmartin was not the only such graveyard in the region. In fact, there were no fewer than 16. But Kilmartin did seem to have the greatest concentration of older stones. Marked by the anonymous straight sword.
Only three firm conclusions could be drawn. The first was that the background of the carvings, and especially the older carvings, remained a mystery. The second, on which virtually everyone agreed, was that these earlier carvings dated from the beginning of the 14th century, the time of Robert the Bruce in Scotland, and the suppression of the Knights Templar elsewhere in Europe. The third conclusion was that the graves with the anonymous straight sword represented a new style, a new development in the region which had appeared suddenly and inexplicably, although Templar holdings elsewhere had been using the design prior to its sudden appearance in Argyle. We had already seen it in a context predating the earliest stones at Kilmartin, as close to home as Temple Garway in Herefordshire, which was indisputably Templar. In Incised Effigial Slabs in Latin Christendom, 1976, the late F. A. Greenhill established, Greenhill established the results of a lifetime spent tabulating medieval graves all over Europe, from the Baltic to the Mediterranean, from Riga to Cyprus. Among the 4,460 graves he lists and describes, he found some without inscriptions, but they were extremely rare. Military gravestones were even rarer. In England, for example, he had found only four, not counting the one at Garway, of which he was unaware. In Ireland, he had found only one. In all of Scotland, except Argyle, he had again found only one. In Argyle, he had found 60 anonymous military gravestones. It was thus clear that the concentration of stones at Kilmartin and adjacent sites was genuinely unique. Almost equally unique was the extraordinary concentration of Masonic graves. Another important source of evidence for us was the Israeli Archaeological Survey Association, which had excavated the old Templar castle of Athlet in the Holy Land. Athlet had been built in 1218 and finally abandoned along with all the other remnants of the Crusaders' kingdom of Jerusalem in 1291. When the castle was excavated, it proved to contain a graveyard with upwards of a hundred stones. Most, of course, had been very badly weathered, and shallow incisions, such as the straight swords we had found in Scotland, had not survived, but a few more deeply chiseled designs had, and these were particularly interesting. One was on the stone of a Templar maritime commander, perhaps an admiral, and, insist, and consisted of a large anchor. One, though very severely worn, still showed a mason square and a plum stone. One believed to be of the master of the Templar masons bore a cross with decorations, a mason square and mall, with only two exceptions these are the earliest known evidence of gravestones bearing Masonic devices. One of the exceptions is rhymes and dates from 1263, and the other of com comparable age is also in France. At the former Templar preceptory of Bourle Templier in Cote d'Or. Sorry, my French pronunciation I, I know is terrible. Here, then, was persuasive evidence to support the chronicle in stone we had tried to decipher in Kilmartin, a chronicle which, if we had deciphered it correctly, or attested to an important early connection between the Templars and what was later to evolve into Freemasonry. Cote d'Or plays a big part in the story, the I think, if I'm remembering correctly, and it's been years since I read it, but I read something about um, Mary Magdalene coming to France and the whole story about um, her being the wife of Jesus and all that. Um, and I'm pretty sure Cote d'Or um, plays a big part in that theory. But again, I might be mixing up some theories. My brain does do that sometimes. Um, in our enthusiasm at our discovery, we had forgotten our original purpose in coming to Argyle. The account of a Templar graveyard on an island in Loch Awe. 
we had assumed the account had become garbled and actually referred to Kilmartin. What we did not know at the time was that we had visited the wrong island. In the autumn of 1987, we returned to Argyle and Loch Awe. By this time, we had learned that the island which prompted our previous visit was not Innis Sirik, but Inishel, some miles to the north. In fact, we had passed it the first time without even noticing it. But if Inishel was the right island, it proved no more fruitful than the wrong island we had visited nine years before. Although we had no difficulty on this occasion in hiring a boat, we did find the ruins of the church dating from the relevant period, the earlier 14th century, but the structure was clearly not Templar. The last regular service conducted in the place, we learned, had been in 1736, and by the end of the century it was already derelict. When we saw it, the interior was a matted tangle of grass, weeds, and nettles, which covered a number of hopelessly worn and cracked grave slabs lining the floor. Outside there were more slabs, the older ones so sunken and overgrown as to be scarcely visible, although others of the later date were still upright. Among the most recent graves were, the, were those of the 11th Duke of Argyle, who had died in 1973, and Brigadier Reginald Fellows, CBE, MC, and Bar, Legion de Honneur, who had died in 1982. The man for whom we had, from whom we had hired our boat reported that he often crossed to Inishel and explored the island. He told us of a slab he had only just discovered, not yet recorded by, by the Royal Commission. Suspecting there might be others, we probed with our pocket knives and indeed found some, but there was nothing to be gleaned from them. If the site is ever properly cleared, these slabs may yet have much of consequence to reveal. Our own amateurish and probably sloppy reconnaissance, however, revealed no suggestion of anything Templar. This was disappointing, but at least we now knew the truth about the hitherto elusive island. Elsewhere around Loch Awe, we found nothing any more conclusive than what existed at Kilmartin, vestiges which were very possibly Templar, which we could argue plausibly to be Templar, but which were not provably so. On a hill to the southwest, south, sorry, southeast of the loch, however, at the ruined 13th century church of Kilnair, we found something curious. In the grass were slabs similar to the latter ornately em embellished slabs at Kilmartin on the later, <laughs> sorry, on one of these, the design was sur surmounted by an unmistakable Templar cross, but the cross was not part of the original meticulously chiseled adornment. It had been clumsily carved into the stone like graffiti at some later date, perhaps as late as the 17th or 18th century. This could hardly be taken as evidence of Templars in the area. It did indicate, however, that someone thereabouts, at some subsequent time, had had some sort of interest in the Templars. We proceeded southwest past the imposing fortress of Castle Sween on the loch of the same name. In the early 14th century, Loch Sween had been a strategically crucial port on the sea route running from Ulster through the isles of Ila and Jura and its, and its castle, besieged and captured by Bruce around 1308 or 1309, and had been the major strong point of the region. The castle itself, reputedly the oldest stone castle on the Scottish mainland, was obviously a maritime citadel with its own harbor for galleys. Fallen stones, some of them dressed, indicated where a breakwater, an inner harbor, and a jetty had been situated. If at the time of the suppression of their order the Templars from Europe had fled by sea to Scotland, this would have been perhaps their most likely disembarkation. Beyond the castle lay the sea, and with the Isle of Jura across the sound to the west, 
its hills cloaked in cloud here on the coast stood the small ruined thirteenth century chapel of kilmery which had ministered to the once thriving maritime parish inside and around the castle there were some forty grave slabs of the same period and kind we had learned to recognize from kilmartin but there were two other items of greater significance providing evidence which was perhaps less copious than we would have liked but which was of sufficient caliber to confirm our theory templar churches invariably had a cross either carved above the entrance or standing freely outside the cross whether simple or embellished was always of distinctive design equal armed with the end of each arm wider than its base inside the chapel of kilmery stood just such a cross dating from before the 14th century had this cross been found anywhere else in europe no one would have had any hesitation in recognizing it as templar and ascribing the chapel to the order furthermore inside the church lay a 14th century grave slab incised with a sailing galley an armed figure and another templar cross this one worked into a floriot design but there was more on that same 14th century grave slab was something that reassured us that our decipherment of the chronicle in stone had not only been tenable but was in its general outline accurate above the head of the armed figure with its templar cross was carved a masonic set square it was now safe to say that there were templars on loch sween and that kilmery had almost certainly been a templar chapel not purpose built for the order but in any rate taken over by them given this evidence it was not yet possible but probable it was not just possible but probable that the graves at kilmartin and elsewhere in the region were indeed templar and that is the end of the prelude that leads us to um, chapter one robert bruce heir to celtic scotland um, is it says one so i'm assuming that's part one of the book and the first chapter is bruce and his struggle for power so we get to read about robert the bruce which is cool um and that will be it until um tuesday on this we'll get back to it then so i'm going to end this session and i will be back um after a break to um start up some Hogwarts Legacy, the 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 game that shall not be named. Um, all right, I will see you in a few minutes.
Prepare to die. 